It's my pleasure to uh, introduce Eric McCall, who will be our guest pastor and speaker today. A um, little bit of background on Eric. Uh, he has served in many capacities in church and parent church leadership. He is the executive director of a, a radio broadcast company. He is a planter of uh, churches, and he is the uh, the vice president of Four Year Bible College. Um, currently, Eric is serving as an associate pastor at Regeneration Church, which is a, a Calvary Chapel affiliate in Santa Cruz. So please join me in welcoming and giving a warm welcome. Good morning. I'm glad you're here. I've preached empty chairs and it's not quite as much fun. Um, uh, he was reading a part of my resume. Um, you go back a few years to, to see the uh, radio broadcast launch. That was a blessing of God. Uh, and all those things in the past just say that I'm uh, here with what God's given me. And I hope it's a, a portion for you as well as it is for me. Uh, I needed this work in my life a lot more uh, than you do. So if I end up going like this a lot in the sermon, you'll know what that means. I'm, I'm trying to apply this lesson to my heart. So our launching verse is faith, hope, and love. Um, before we get into that, I want to bring greetings from a sister church, the Regeneration Church down in Scotts Valley. We're praying for you, we're praying for your pastor, and we're praying for the Spirit to descend on this church. Because apart from him, it's really tough uh, to get something done for the gospel. Usually when we're in this passage, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, uh, we just immediately launch over the first two. Why do we do that? Because the greatest of these is love. And we always teach love, you know, over marriages. It, these verses are used a lot when it's time to get married. Over uh, family conflict, we pray these words over um, small groups and over our congregation. But um, I want to back up and spend more time on faith and hope and then apply faith and hope to an active love, a love that is getting something done, uh, a love with boots on. So I'd like for you to listen for love with boots on as we begin. I'm not discounting the, the truth of love. It's patient, kind, no envy, no boasting. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It's not insistent, not irritable, not resentful. Uh, it doesn't rejoice in wrong. It rejoices in the truth, bears all, believes all, hopes all, endures all. Thank you that love never ends. Prophecies in tongues, it says they'll cease when the real word returns. Uh, so, but until then, uh, we are to live in love. And we're going to focus on the first two, first faith and then hope and how they might inform our love. In the Old Testament, the concept of faith is um, being firm, standing well, and a person of excellence doing something you can depend on. It's this notion of firm action. And for there to be firm action, there has to be two in mind, the faith-er and the faith-e. Faith in a vacuum isn't worth anything. Faith applied is where we see the value. In the New Testament, it's a little bit different. Um, the verb is translated to believe, but as an adjective, it's faithful. So when you are believing something firm and confident, you're actually faithing it into reality in your life. Whenever you speak of the things of faith, you can't get to those things of faith without belief. And so um, you can say believing and faithing and, and be right. The context, again, is a firm relationship between two. Like, keep the faith, brother. Let's stay at this together, right? Rabbi and student. A student of a rabbi has to walk so close to him that the dust off his robes falls on our robes. That's faithful. Uh, we talk about mentors and mentees. We talk about disciplers and new converts. It's always in the context 
God and his followers. It's a faith relationship. And don't miss out on the relationship part because that's where we're going in this. Yes, it's fidelity. Yes, it's loyalty, commitment, trust, belief, and proof. But a saving faith is a belief in, a trust in, and a reliance on the person of Jesus Christ. Anything short of that, all you have is religion. Anything more than that, all you have is theology and doctrine. It is the relationship with Jesus Christ that gives street cred to our faith. In the New Testament, it's a resolute knowing. Have you ever heard a preacher say, I know that I know that I know that I know that I know it's true. It's that kind of conviction. It's not just a, an, a, an assent to truth. It is an apprehension of truth. Belief with trust and confidence in God and Christ and the character of the one who can be relied on. How do you rely on somebody you've never seen? It's by faith. That's the only way you can rely on someone you can't see. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Well, time for a litmus test. By faith, the people of old received God's blessing. By faith, worlds were set in order. Abel's offering was acceptable. Enoch was taken up. Noah was warned. Abraham obeyed and given the promised land. By faith, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, they were blessed. By faith, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, David, Samuel, all by faith. Miracles happened. So here's the litmus test. By faith, what comes after your name? By faith, Lewis has been faithful here for decades. By faith, Jeff serves us with the gift of hospitality. By faith, I got to sit with a group of folks praying for you, for us. What comes after faith in your testimony? We got to wrestle with that. I'm taking time here because we have to contend with that. There ought to be something to fill in the blank after you come to faith, right? Well, what is this faith? The scripture describes it as a deposit. The deposit of faith is the Holy Spirit. Now, it is God who establishes both us and you in Christ. He anoints us, places his seal on us, puts his spirit in our hearts as a deposit for what is to come. This deposit then something's supposed to be happening. If all you got was a deposit and you never make a withdrawal, deposit's worthless to you until you make a withdrawal. So you've received the deposit. Now what, church? Now what? That's the question we're struggling with today. God's given us the Spirit as a deposit. He guarantees what's to come. You can take it to the bank. No, don't take it to the bank. Take it to the Spirit. Because it's the Spirit that will help you fill in the blank of what comes after faith. The classic definition of faith. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the firm conviction of things not seen. You're seeing the pattern here. It's the notion of believing it true, being persuaded of the truth, to credit it to the truth, and place confidence in our saving faith. Uh, before Pat, and we're praying for Pat and his recovery, um, you were in John, and you're coming up to a point of John, specifically John 17, where Jesus prays for you and me and says, sanctify them in your truth. It is the truth of God that gives you the faith to fill in the blank on what comes afterward. Faith is grounded in the absolute reality of the past and the absolute hope for the future. If you do not believe what God has done in the past, 
you will be unable to manifest hope with God on what's coming in the future. It's got to be faith-based. It's how we're to live. The righteous shall live by faith. Abraham believed he faithed God, and it was credited to him. The law can't justify. Why? Because we live by faith. Through the Spirit, by faith, we wait in hope for righteousness. When we can't do something in a good conscience, the Bible says we should not do it at all. For whatever is not of faith is sin. In fact, I love the Amplified Version. Anything done with doubt is sinful for the believer, for the faither. So faith isn't just the positive ledger. Faith helps you avoid the negative side of the ledger. You get to choose every time you open your mouth. You get to choose every time you put something in. You get to choose every time you relate to other people because faith is relational, right? We worry about the world. But I am convicted that spiritual optimism is the only path for the believer. Spiritual pessimism is an oxymoron. It robs you of your living faith. Are things in the world in free fall? I don't have to rehearse the list. You read it in the news every single day. Every other tweet tells us just how uh, bad the real world is. And there's always this urgency. Within the next 24 hours, it's all coming to an end. Lord, help us not enter into the fear. Lord, help us with our spiritual optimism. And if you're not very optimistic spiritually, you haven't read the word. The lamb wins in the end. Isn't that optimistic? We get to start from a position of knowing things that haven't happened yet. If the Lord tarries, it may be a while. If he comes before I'm done speaking, Maranatha, thank you, Jesus. I don't have to finish this. So what's the relationship between this firm faith that we bury in our hearts and hope? That spiritual optimism is the key. Faith in the character of God brings us hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Question, when we're at the McDonald's with a cup of coffee in our hand and we're complaining about every single thing, we love going across the landscape. Oh, to government. Oh, to military. Oh, those people on whichever side of the fence you're not on. Oh, those heathens. Oh, those atheists. Look at what they're saying and doing. The world's coming to an end. May the God of hope Fill you with joy instead and peace instead because you have faith in him. You would blow every person at the table's mind if you started talking optimism because God's got it. Right? My soul, why are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which is our yes, ascends to God for his glory. That's spiritual breathing. We give our amen to God. He gives us his promises. We give our amen to God. He gives us his promises. This is not a health and wealth gospel. This is the truth of scripture. He loves you enough to listen when you faith. 30 years ago, we sang an old chorus. And since some of you weren't even born then, um, I want to share it with you because this is the posture of hope and its relationship to faith. Yes, Lord, yes. To your will and to your way. I'm saying yes, Lord. Yes, I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me with my whole heart, I agree. Because my answer is always, yes, Lord. Yes. Can a fully devoted follower of Christ ever get away with saying, no, Lord, no. The Lord orders the servants around. 
the servant doesn't order the Lord around. And Romans clearly teaches us, you're a slave to somebody. You're a slave to righteousness. You're a slave to the law of sin and death. You get to choose, but you don't get to argue with your Lord if he is truly your Lord. Now let's go to hope. In the Hebrew mind, hope is this languishing, this trust while waiting. Um, There's a confidence, there's a security. I have no doubts, but I'm trusting in deliverance. I'm trusting in safety and protection. I'm hoping and patiently waiting with longing. If you want to get that Jewish sense, half the Psalms are, oh God, look what's going wrong. It's all terrible. Sound familiar? But then right at the bottom, it's always, oh, that's right. But you are my God and I will yet praise you. Isn't that half the Psalms? If you forget, you get stuck in the first half of the Psalms. Don't live there. Do not moan to fellow believers. Do not moan to those that are yet found because they'll think you're just like them and you ought to be different than them. You ought to be salt and light. We ought to be the voice of encouragement. Hope sanctifies. Hope stimulates really good work. If there ain't no use, if there ain't no hope, why bother? You can live three weeks without food if you're lucky. You can live three days without water if you're lucky. Some can live even three minutes without air. But you can't live three seconds without hope. Because the moment a person loses sight of hope, they lose sight of their life. This is a life and death matter. If you don't have something to look forward to, getting out of bed is an impossible task. But hope in the Greek mind isn't this this waiting, this longing for something good to happen. We're optimistic about what's coming. We can't wait to see the good stuff God's going to do. He gives good gifts to those who call on him by name, right? And he's a good God and he's a loving God and he cares for us and he leads us and he empowers us and he encourages us. Oh my word, looking forward with pleasure. Gotta ask, how pleasurable is your Christianity to taste in the marketplace, at work, in school? in the grocery store. I always find a way to get in the line with Little Miss Helpless. She's been on the job 12 minutes. She doesn't know where the buttons on the cashier are and I have to bag for her. And I've got two choices right then and there. I can say something encouraging and help her get through this transaction. Or I can get frustrated and get angry and say something snippy. Servers at restaurants listen to our conversations. And when we invoke the name of Jesus and then destroy our brother or sister in the next five minutes, they heard both of those. They heard you claim his name. And then they hear what you said. And that's your witness in that moment. What if God gave you that server for you to be optimistic with them and encouraging them and greeting them and thanking them for their service? If you mention Jesus once, you better give a good fat tip. If you talk about a Christian story, you better bless that soul because they don't need to connect a scarcity mindset with the spiritual optimism of your belief, your faith. They should be blessed just because you walked in the room. You have that capacity. God gave you that gift to give to someone else. But what's worth hoping for, Eric? When the world is in chaos. Remember the two on the Emmaus road? Jesus shows up and says, hey dudes, what's going on? Loose paraphrase. Um, But we had really hoped that he was the one who was going to fix this mess. Right? Friends will betray us. Partners leave us. Businesses bankrupt us. Bosses fire us. Kids disrespect us. Sibling will cut us off without a word and disown us. Popular culture will ridicule, dismiss, and marginalize us. Health fails us. Church disappoints us. The world's in crisis. Wars, rumors of wars, culture in free fall. 
And yet on the Maus Road, Jesus asked, how much revelation is needful for the moment? What do you need to get through today? Are we going to go to war in 2024? Any prophets in here? God knows. He ain't telling. Is the world coming to an end because that uh, near-earth object is finally going to splash in the Atlantic and take us away like it did? The... No. no. That's not what we should be worried about. How much revelation is needful for the moment? I'll tell you. To get through this moment. When you're at the mechanic and he gives you bad news, you need Enough to get through that moment. You should be blessing the mechanic. When you go on the car lot to buy a new car, he's not your adversary. He's a guy with a family with kids. You should find ways to bless your salesman on the car lot and pray for them the entire time you have a transaction. What gives you the right to pray for the car salesman? The transaction. Any place you go, the teller at the bank, she's not in your way. She is your way. Right? You're the only smile she's going to get. You're the only word of encouragement she'll ever get. Let's assume there's not another priest in the room. You're the only priest there. Do your priestly duties. Bless. He explained everything concerning himself. So when you find yourself in a sticky wicket, when you find your temperature elevating and you're leaning in and you're right ready to grab somebody by the neck, What's needful in Revelation for this moment to avoid that conflict? Jesus will explain it to you if you invite him into that moment, into that conflict. You know, I know I'm living proof that everything gets better when Jesus shows up and we invite him in and listen to him. Everything goes sideways. Have you ever heard a Christian say, I know I'm a believer, but I just decked my boss. I just but I'm a Christian. Here's what I do know. You did not invite Jesus into that moment as you were uh, pulling back. You were holy in the flesh. Own it, ask for forgiveness, and invite Jesus into the next moment of your life. If Jesus is before you, you operate in greater protection than if you're operating in the flesh. Stop it. Invite Jesus in, right? So what are we hoping for? What's the world hoping for? Money, car, houses, clothes, toys? I want to be attractive. I want to be skilled. I want to be confident. I want to walk the world as if I am a conqueror in this world. That's what I want. I want to travel, have adventure. I want to be a volunteer and have it meaningful. What little endangered something can I go save so I can feel better about me, not the thing I was saving? I want friends. I want to be free. I want to be significant. I want to have impact. I want to be healthy and vital and energetic. I want spiritual intimacy. I want to know what my purpose is. How is all this going to work? It's going to work as we enter into faith, as we apprehend hope, as the reason for us having a good time with this mess. The mess is the mess. Until God returns, we're not fixing the mess. But we can fix our hearts and our attitudes as we lean into the mess and maybe be the only blessing in the mess. We get to bless if we want to, if we choose to. There's hope from Revelation 2 through 321, 2, 7 through 321. And it's to the overcomer, to the one that's victorious, to the one who gets faith and gets hope. Now that we've got faith and hope, what do we do with it? Well, I'm going to permit him to eat of the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. Where have we heard that tree of life? Remember, that was one of the trees in the garden that they were allowed to eat from. It was the other tree they weren't allowed to eat from. All through the rest of Scripture, there's this concept of the very epicenter of faith and hope. Blessed are those who find wisdom, a tree of life to those who take hold of her. The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. A fulfilled desire is as a tree of life. A gentle tongue is a tree of life. It's a symbol for eternal life. The one who is victorious will in no way be harmed by the second death. 
We know what the second death is? We have this notion in the popular culture, um, fear of missing out, you only live once, and it's uh, get all you can, can all you get, and brag about it and make fun of those who don't have as much as you. That's the uh, uh, materialistic path. But the fact is, we're all eternal. Our eternality was given to us by God. All of us, every human being on the planet ever created is an eternal being. What's in question is not your eternality. What's in question is your destination. If you only have one birth, you're going to have two deaths. You're going to have a physical death, and you're going to have a spiritually, inexplicably horrendous spiritual death. Much better. Have two births. A physical birth and a spiritual birth. Because then you'll only have one death. A physical death. And for me to die is gain. Right? Picture this for a moment. I'm talking about an optimism that is so severe. So ridiculously fun. I'm invincible until God's done with me. Think that through for a moment. Could you imagine going on an adventure with God and having so much fun, so much deep-seated joy? Because between you, he, and the Holy Spirit, the three of you, you make a majority, right? You're talking to someone who may or may not be found. They're the minority. Don't act like they're the majority. You're the majority because of who you keep company with, who you have relationship with. You're the strongest, most confident voice in the room because you know, and you're the priest. So live into your role. I'm going to give you manna, the one that overcomes. I'm going to give you an inner life. I'm going to give you a white stone. Oh, the white stone is a true appreciation of your innocence when hid in Christ. We've all got junk in the rearview mirror, but none of that is hid in Christ. So why bring your junk into the relationship? Christ has already taken care of your junk. If you've given it to him and it's under the blood. Everything in um, Revelation is a departure from truth. There is the Trinity and then there's an unholy Trinity in Revelation. There are miracles, but then there are unholy miracles in Revelation. Um, Jesus is the bright and morning star. That is his title. But Satan wants the, uh, the title as well. And so there's a lot of um, pretending to be. But Jesus says, I'm going to dress him in white clothing. I'll never erase a name from the book of life. I'll declare the name before Father and before the angels. White clothing is just your raiment of faith and your raiment of hope. It's what you stand in to be able to stand with the righteousness because if you're not clothed with Christ, you have no right to stand. You got nothing to stand on. You're in the same mess everybody else is in without Christ. I'm going to grant the victorious permission to sit with me on my throne just as I too conquered and sat with my father. Man, there's so many promises when you step into it. Hope is inspired by our faith, but it's also an expression of it. It's this forward-thinking bias toward action. Hey, God, what do you want to do today? What trouble can we get into today? How much fun can we have today? Christianity is not drudgery. But wait a minute, Edgar, what about persecution? Yes, there's persecution. And if you read carefully in the New Testament, those who are Christ followers, Sang while being in prison. Counted it joy when they received a beating because they knew who was the stronger party in that exchange. All I got was a physical beating, but we brought glory to God. And that's who's important in this transaction. If you are God conscious, Jesus following, spirit aware, you will never get it wrong, no matter how bad the conflict is. If they lock you up, if they kill you, it's okay because you're invincible until God's done with you. 
I love that. True hope is biblical optimism lived out. True hope. I can't help but know it's going to be okay with Jesus. Because he would protect me if it wasn't. And that doesn't mean that he owes me a full life. He owes me a, a high net worth life. He owes me a physically fit life. He may entrust to you physical malady. He may entrust you with abject poverty. He may entrust you with relational conflict. But that's the landscape on which he wants to meet you. Do you want to meet God? That's where you meet him. In our conflicts, in our messiness. It's not an exception to your schedule. It is your schedule. Right? Both mind and heart are engaged in salvation. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that's a statement of faith. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not because you got it done. Theology 101. We want to do what God's supposed to do, and we ask God to do what we're supposed to do. We get those backwards. God is capable of doing the heavy lifting in our lives. We're not. All we can do is trust and obey. So how many times have you been given an assignment by God and you knew it? Right? Right? And you said, no, Lord, no. That is dangerous ground. So faith, hope, and love. He's with me in faith. He has a plan which generates hope in my heart. So in faith, hope, and love, we give it all to Jesus. And I don't say give it all to Jesus and love uh, lightly. Did you know that current brain science uh, is less true than Scripture? But you can find brain science in Scripture if you look for it. Scientists will tell us, if you think a new thought, believe a new belief, faith a new element of faith, memorize a new Scripture, create new pathways in your brain, they got a fancy name for it. It's called neurogenesis. All that means is the beginning of a new thought. Bing! The light bulb comes on. You make a connection. Well, Sue has this, and Ralph has that, and this needs done. What if that what if, that spark of creativity that God gave you? Neurogenesis. But did you know that if you repeat something, the pathways get stronger and stronger and stronger? You remember that hurt. It was 30 years ago. It was 10 days ago. It was last night. You remember that hurt. And the more you rehearse it, the stronger that memory becomes and the greater your defeat becomes. But what if you were to actually go back to Scripture and rehearse that Scripture and strengthen those chords? Say what's true about you and say that. The only way to get rid of a negative thought and a negative experience isn't to bury it. Because if you bury it, it's going to pop back up somewhere else worse than it was before. But if you deal with it by giving it to God, then you have a way forward. And the only way forward is to lay down new tracks, lay down new thoughts. You can replace every negative thought. Here's how easy it is. Have you ever gone to a church where they hand out something called the bulletin? You know what that thing is, right? It's got all this stuff on the front. It's got all this stuff on the back. And for some reason, the guy gets up and he tells you everything that's on the front. And he tells you everything that's on the back. Wait a minute, I know how to read. And the bulletin hits the can before it goes to the end of the hallway. Because I've consumed it. He already told me everything. I kind of glanced and nothing in it for me. So poof, reframe the argument. Don't believe it's a bulletin. Believe it's your prayer guide. Take it with you. Stick it on your fridge or on the place you pass by the most. It has life and utility for the entire week for you, for intercession, if you believe that you have a role in these people's lives that are on this piece of paper. I can pray for the women's ministry from afar, or I can bulletin it. Wouldn't you rather be involved in the things of God? Isn't that way more fun? 
I don't want to consume a bulletin and walk away from my church before I even get out the front door. I want to take my church with me. All the staff are there. Let's pray for them. All of the ministries are there. Let's pray for them. All the opportunities this next week for us to engage. Let's engage. But it's what you think about, right? Philippians 4, 8, and 9. It starts with think about. Paul calls what's between the years the landscape of war. The battle is won or lost in the mind. Whatever's true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Think about those things and then live into them, right? Thinking about them is not enough. That's a static faith. So now we get to the punchline. We got to love God because that's commanded. Got to love people because that's commanded. And it's also commanded that we make disciples. So naturally, evangelism is on the table. But what kind of evangelism? Is it an evangelism that makes me feel better about me because I did what God told me to do? And hey, God, I was obedient. So in this transaction, I get your grace. Or is it an evangelism born of this enthusiasm for those not found yet? Love is evangelism. Evangelism is an expression of God's love. In love, God can fill your heart with his love for those not yet found. It is not natural for me to care about people I don't know. But in the spirit, I want to meet every friend I can before I'm with Jesus, because I'm going to take as many of them as possible with me, and I can't take them if they're not friends. So you will never catch me uh, being unkind or cruel to someone. And if you do, smack me upside the head and remind me who I am. Because I'm not that guy. I don't ever want to be that guy. We start with God's heart. If your evangelism does not start with God's heart, you're starting from a false premise. Please, please capture God's heart for the lost and then live into God's love for the lost. We can't perform evangelism in hopes of winning or keeping God's love. You're not a first-class Christian if you evangelize and a second-class Christian if you don't. Uh, let me just erase that barrier for you. All of us are priests, and even if we fail to open our mouth, we can pray. Right? Lord, help us with this, please. We got to return again and again to the Father and get the Father's eyes on what His heart is interested in. We got to lead in love. Are the four spiritual laws cool? Yeah. Is the Romans road cool? Yeah. Are the two spiritual questions great? Yeah. But Calvary Chapel has not embraced a method, which means you're totally free to be you when you're living into your faith. You're totally free to be you when you're gifting your hope to someone else. You get to be you because God created you, sees value in you, and wants your voice in the world. I'd spent a lot of my career in marketing, and the, the central theme of marketing is people hate to be sold. Don't you just hate that? Every smarmy salesman you've ever seen, people hate to be sold. But we love to buy when we know we're buying the coolest, the best, the most value, the neatest one. Yeah, all those other people, they have last year's model. But look at the one I've got. If you bought believing you've bought the best, you go tell 10 people, right? Faith? Is there a better faith than faith in God? Is there more hope than we can have in what God accomplished on the cross and what he's accomplishing with his second coming? I hate to be sold. People tell me, well, don't you hate religion? Yes, I hate religion. Um, if you mean that hypocritical thing that no one enjoys and everyone loves to poke fun at, I don't consider that religion. But taking care of widows and orphans, I kind of like that religion. Visiting the ones in uh, jail, caring for the homeless, feeding the hungry, clothing the unclothed, Whatever that ministry looks like, I kind of like that religion, don't you? Oh, yeah, those are cool, dude. Okay, great. If they're cool, what's your motive for doing those? 
Uh, I'm not sure. Well, I know my motive. I want you to embrace your motive because we're called to by a guy that loves us. He loves us so much. He wants us. He gave us the privilege of going. I love that. I can't wait. People can tell if you're trying to sell the gospel. They can sniff in authenticity a mile away. They know if you're faking it. But if you're reaching out to them in love and offering them the love you've received, when they look over your shoulder and they see the genuine thing, and then you hear Paul's command, follow after me as I follow after Christ, you wouldn't follow Paul if you didn't love the Christ he was talking about, because that's hard. You want to become a loving evangelist? Rock your world. Go ask God for Luke 15 heart. In Luke 15, there are three cool stories. One's a lost sheep, one's a lost coin, one's a lost son. You would think the commonality between the three of those is what was lost, but it's not. The commonality is what happens when it's found. What's happened when somebody finds what's valuable? Found my sheep. Let's call the neighbors and friends and tell them. I put the 99 in the field safe. I went after the one. That one is found. Celebrate with me. I turned on the lights. I tore the house up looking for this thing that was valuable. Call the friends and neighbors again. The father's love standing at the edge of the property. Found my son. Let's party. Isn't that worth a party when someone comes from lost to found? Isn't that worth a little bitty happy dance? Halfway up, think Jesus, something. Something has got to be valued here or evangelism simply won't happen. Right? So in faith, we believe. From faith, we manifest a true hope. Not in us, in the one in whom we place our faith. In hope, we hold love for the lost. If your evangelism does not have a perspective of God's love for the lost, don't waste your energy. Save yourself and them some time. It's like trying to teach a pig to sing. It's really hard work and it really annoys the pig. But if you're sharing from love what's happening in you, no one can take that away from you, right? Nobody can rob you of your witness. They can take your house, your car, your bank account. They can take your family. They can take your life. But to the death, they can't take your witness. You have to surrender that. Don't surrender. Since we love the lost, and see them as people who need to be found by God, do we have the courage to ask God to renew our hearts with his love for lost people? If so, you know what that means? It means you get to ask God to open your mouth and share the gospel when he tells you it's the right time. There's three kind of hunters in the world. Uh, One shoots at everything. One shoots at nothing. They're just going along because they love the grub and they love to get away from the wife and they love the the camaraderie and the jokes around the fire. But the third one knows what he's hunting and knows when to capture the prey. And we are those that are to contend for the souls of men and capture their hearts for Christ. Not that we do that work. We've not done any of this. Faith starts with what he can do, not what we can do. But we got to show up, people. We got to show up. Hardest uh, scripture in 1 John. If we say we love our neighbors, but never bring up the gospel with them, the fact, the spiritual fact is you don't love your neighbor if you don't share what's most important to you with them. Hey, what do you do for a living? Oh, I love my job. Here, let me tell you about my job. Well, what's your hobbies? Hey, I'm a Niners fan. I hope they win today. You get through an hour and a half a six-pack of root beer and some chips and nachos, and Jesus never showed up? You're waiting for the other guy to surface Jesus in this conversation. 
Who's the priest in the room? Who knows Jesus best? Is it us? We got to kill our fear and anxiety about someone rejecting Jesus when we witness. We're literally not in the conversation once we've witnessed and said what we have to say is true based on what we've lived. Now the conversation is between the Holy Spirit and the one we hope gets found. If they say, no, I want to stay lost. Who got insulted there? Did you? No, you don't have to fear rejection because you're not on the block here. If you are truly evangelizing in love. The time you're on the block is if you're looking for a notch in your spiritual belt, I'm leaving this conversation with one more convert because that's who I am. Uh, yeah, you could be really disappointed, but I would challenge your motives. I would challenge your motives. Who are you witnessing of? Yourself or the guy who gave you so much love that you now have love left over to share with someone else? Has anyone ever told you about Jesus? You can't assume everyone in this room knows Jesus, has faith in him, has hope in him, and is walking with him. But this question, has anyone ever told you about Jesus? No, you haven't heard the good news? Man. God loves us with an everlasting love. He loves us with so much love, there's some to spread around. If we choose to. Faith, to be truly faith, must be lived in the present tense. Hope, to be biblical hope, must be lived in the future tense. But attaching ourselves to the love of God, it's a choice. We can continue to live lackluster, lukewarm, cultural Christian lives if we want to choose. But what an adventure to lead in love. Love is a choice, choice born of faith powered by hope, expressed in our love of God, our love for others, and yes, our love of self. Did you know that if you don't love yourself very well, you're probably not going to witness for Christ? You haven't gotten yourself out of the way yet. Some people say that the way you get yourself out of the way is you just stop thinking about you. Your witness is what is attractive. I think the most important thing about you and the most attractive thing that's true of you is what God's doing with you and through you. That's what people are hungry for. Not you selling them religion, but you living life with them. Once we have faith and hope, we can love God and every person is a target of our love. And a love-led evangelism will result in more love. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. It's a daily thing, folks. Let's talk to God about it. Lord, you're a good God. You are worthy to be praised. You are the highest, the most glorious. We sang about that a moment ago. We're going to sing about it again. Why do we sing? Because we say it's true. If it's true, how thou shall we live? How then shall we live? Lord, you've got so much joy for us when we share Christ gain a new brother, gain a new sister. I can't wait to meet my next friend. If possible, Lord, I want to take him with me to eternity because everybody needs a good friend. And Jesus, you call us friends. We're no longer slaves, no longer masters. Oh God, you love us enough to call us friends. Help us love the lost enough to call them friends. Go find them like Jesus did. Go love them like the disciples did. Care for one another like we know is true in Scripture. Lord, make it true in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.